Hello everyone. Um, before I begin, I wanted to let you all know that closed caption is available below. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Tiana Williams, and in addition to being a Bowdoin alum, class of 2012, go you bears. I am currently studying at Yale University where I'm working on an environmental history of, black, of the black power and black feminist movements. So I wanted to apologize in advance for possibly moving away from more traditional introductions. Matthew Klingel is a longtime mentor, colleague, and now friend of mine. So when I was asked to introduce him today, I jumped at the opportunity. Professor Klingel, who now insists that I call him Matt, has been my mentor for more than 10 years. Matt met me at a very weird time in my life. I was 18 years old and had never been away from my hometown of DC or even my family for long. I was having a hard time adjusting to all of those main winters that some of you may fondly remember. I completed my first semester and it was a rough one, so rough that I was sure that I was going to drop out and return to DC. That winter, I was encouraged to take Matt's first year seminar on Western history. I met with Matt in advance and in my own insecurities, sort of dumped all of my problems on him right away. I told him I was having a rough transition at Bowdoin. I told him it was recommended that I take his class, but that I was inexperienced and wasn't sure that I was going to do so well. Unbeknownst to me, Matt was also a former high school teacher um, and was unruffled by my existential crisis. He reassured me that this class would be a perfect fit and offered his office hours as a space for us to work through any kinks. He even allowed me to practice my points for class in advance because I was so nervous about speaking in seminars, for which now I'm very grateful because now in my own graduate seminars, I have to remind myself to stop talking all the time. He also showed me the art of line editing by reading my paper back to me. Yes, it was excruciating, but never scary because he thoughtfully shared earlier drafts of his own writing. He often told me anyone who says writing is um, easy is full of unpleasant things. I probably was in his office every Wednesday and in many ways learned more from him there than in the class not because he's anything less than a fantastic facilitator, but because he created a safe space where I could truly be myself. This is a testament to who he is as a professor, never judgmental, always wanting the very best for his students. He encouraged me to pursue my concern that we were not talking about race enough in environmental history. And here I am now, a PhD candidate in African American studies and history and it all started with Matt reaffirming that I too belonged at Bowdoin. I could go on and on how to this day he has continued to mentor me. I still think that he has a better way of describing what my dissertation research is. I am so honored to introduce him today and I want to personally thank you Matt for your role in who I am as an academic. And with that, I suppose I should get to the point by properly introducing our speaker today. Matthew Klingel, a fourth generation Westerner, was born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. A historian of the United States, his research and teaching focuses on the North American West, environmental history, urban history, social and cultural history, and the history of science, technology, and medicine. He has received fellowships and awards for his work from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, and other government and professional organizations. He is the author of Emerald City, an environmental history of Seattle, as well as numerous scholarly and general audience articles, secondary school and teaching materials, book chapters, and essays. He also held a national fellowship in 2010, 2002, excuse me, from the Environmental Leadership Program, a national organization training emerging leaders from wide ranging social and professional backgrounds to promote greater diversity in the environmental movement. In 2006, he received the Sidney B. Kowalski Prize, Bowdoin's annual teaching prize for junior faculty. His current book project, Sweet Blood, 
Diabetes and the Nature of Modern Health, under contract with Yale University Press, explores how today's health crisis grows from our changing relationships with nature and shifting patterns of social inequality in, in the United States and the world from the late 19th century to the present day. And with that, I'll have Matt take it away. All right, we're trying to figure out technical difficulties here as I need to get my video started. There we go, start my video. There we go, fantastic. The joys of living in our brave new world of technology and social distancing. Um, I wanna thank uh, the Office of Alumni Relations, especially Amy El Kalubi and colleagues and Rody Lloyd. And I'd also especially like to thank Tiana one of the joys of teaching is getting to see your own students do so fabulously well after they leave the classroom, the laboratory, or the studio. And it was a real honor to be introduced by a gifted, brilliant, and passionate young scholar such as Tiana. And mark my word, she is going to make a difference in the fields of study in which she's engaging. For about the next 30 or 35 minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about our current pandemic. But I wanna say before I launch into my discussion that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions, as many as you'd like, during the course of the event, and we'll try to answer as many as we can afterwards. So with that in mind, let me get over to the talk. Now, as an environmental historian, I'm interested in the past, but the past that I'm interested in and how the past informs the present is a little bit more complicated because environmental historians not only follow change over time, complexity, contingency, causality, and context, the principles of good historical thinking in the context of human relations, we also bring in the complicated and entangled world of nature both material, physical nature, as well as our ideas of it. And so what I propose to do today is a narrative structure that reflects my training as an environmental historian and historian of medicine and public health. For this talk, I'm gonna contrast the 1918-1919 H1N1 influenza pandemic, commonly known as the Spanish flu pandemic, with our current coronavirus pandemic. One bit about nomenclature. SARS-CoV-2 refers to the specific type of coronavirus we're facing in this pandemic, while COVID-19 refers to the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. A good analogy might be that between HIV and AIDS. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the latter term, COVID-19, has become shorthand for the larger pandemic. There'll be four parts of this presentation. There'll be emergence, the origin of the viruses in 1918, 18, 18, 1919, and again in our present pandemic, the spread, the way the virus has moved around the planet, the epidemiology, which is the incidence, distribution, and possible control of the viruses in both pandemics, and then the aftermath, some possible responses to and long-lasting consequences of each pandemic. The first part of the narrative this afternoon is the emergence of novel pathogens, pathogens that human beings have not seen before. And as I'll argue, emergence is dependent upon the creation of new environmental and social conditions that can yield potentially threatening pathogens that can cause pandemics. The first case of the Spanish flu was reported on March 4th, 1918 at Camp Funston, part of Fort Riley, a US military base just outside of Manhattan, Kansas, home to Kansas State University where young men were training to join the Allied troops on the Western Front. But that first official case may not have been the origin of what became the most lethal and widespread pandemic in human history. One widely accepted theory suggests that the H1N1 flu strain identified at Camp Funston may have come from nearby Haskell County, Kansas, located in the southwest corner of that state near Oklahoma and Colorado. This had once been part of the great bison commons that spanned the Great Plains before the usurpation and attempted expulsion of the indigenous peoples there that relied upon the bison. The bison were replaced with cattle, and by the beginning of the early 20th century, the central United States and southern prairies of the Canadian prairie provinces had become the meat locker for the entire planet. But overhead, large streams 
of eight migrating birds would, of course, do what birds do in flight. They would defecate. And in some cases, those defecations may have led to the transmission of the virus from an avian host to a bovine host and possibly to human beings. Other researchers have speculated the pandemic may have begun elsewhere, perhaps in France in 1916 or in Southeast Asia in 1917, but the mechanisms were likely the same. The spillover of viruses from wild animals and epizoic disease, a disease that is, exists in animals, moving into human hosts from domesticated animals to human beings. So the origins of the current SARS-CoV-2 virus are sketchy, but based on historical experience with other viruses, and previous coronaviruses and influenzas, we have some possible ideas. Coronaviruses have long known to be epizoics or diseases, as I said, that are prevalent in animal populations. Sometimes, as with influenza, these epizoics can spill over or merge in other mammals or avian species. Often they're propelled by the wildlife trade, and then as they move into their human hosts, they mutate and then begin to infect human hosts. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, the consumption of wild and domesticated animals for meat sold in what are commonly called wet markets, coupled with habitat fragmentation, which puts humans and their livestock in greater contact with bats, birds, and other wild animals, is likely the source for the current coronavirus. Many of the hotspots for emerging diseases, such as SARS-CoV-2, are also many of the hotspots imperiled for biodiversity, as you can see in this map from the non-governmental organization, Conservation International, from 2017. Now, this leads me to my second theme, and this is spread. The emergence of a novel pathogen alone isn't enough to cause a pandemic. There are plenty of examples of epizoics that jump from animal hosts to intermediate animal hosts, such as wild to domesticated animals, and eventually to human beings. But it's how they spread. And the second part of this narrative is how the pathogen can move well beyond its place of origin. Infectivity and virulence play important roles. From an evolutionary perspective, for a pathogen to become pandemic, the pathogen cannot be so virulent that it kills off any potential reservoir of hosts completely, but it should be highly infectious. Even that alone isn't enough. It also has to travel. And this is how humans have further created new environments in the modern age that have helped pathogens become pandemic. In the case of the 1918-1919 pandemic, it was war. And in this case, it was the shipment, perhaps, if we believe the origin story of the pathogen beginning in the central United States, that the soldiers from places such as Camp Funston, moving around to become part of the American Expeditionary Force on the Western Front, brought it over to Europe. Now, infected soldiers likely carried influenza from Funston or other army camps in the States. 24 of the 36 large army camps in the U.S. had outbreaks on the eve of shipping U.S. troops overseas. By April of 1918, the pandemic had spread in many cities in America and reached Europe. And during this time, it earned its moniker, the Spanish flu, because wartime reporting about the flu was heavily censored both in the United States and among the wartime combatants in Europe. But Spain was neutral, and therefore its press operated with fewer constraints, and thus the name Spanish flu. But the 1918 pandemic at first set off few alarms because it seemed to be killing at a relatively slow but consistent rate. But then what happened is it came back with greater virulence in a second wave later that autumn, and then began to move around the world. As the second wave began churning around the globe from tropical Africa to subarctic Canada, it took lives at an alarming rate. Cities and towns that had curtailed or banned public events, encouraged good hygiene, and required citizens to wear masks had to re-implement public health restrictions. And in some places, the pandemic would not be overcome until late 1919 or even in 1920. Now, in the case of the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the first reports of the novel coronavirus emerged in late December in 2019 in Wuhan, Hubei province in the People's Republic of China. Until the outbreak of SARS, this group of viruses, the coronaviruses, was greatly overlooked. But two previous epidemics that had not gone fully global the SARS and the MERS outbreaks had been studied in greater detail, which prompted some officials in China and elsewhere to pay attention. So on January 7, 2020, the causative agent was identified as a new coronavirus. The disease was later renamed as COVID-19 by the World Health Organization. The spread of SARS-CoV-2 was assisted thanks to extensive travel in the People's Republic of China at the start of the Chunyun period, a 40-day period when people travel home to see family and celebrate 
the Lunar New Year. It is one of the largest regular migrations of human beings on the planet. Chinese authorities shut down travel and post quarantine since they began to grasp the gravity of the situation, first in Wuhan on January 23rd, but by then the virus had already spread globally, primarily by commercial air travel. If there is a mercy in this pandemic, it's that coronaviruses don't seem to mutate as rapidly and cause, to cause greater virulence as, say, influenza viruses. But certain genomic strains have mutated toward greater possible infectivity. The GIF you see here from April 2020, created by the data visualization nonprofit nextstrain.org, shows the various strains of CoV-2 as emerging from China then spreading to other parts of the globe. Two of these strains came into the United States, one from Europe, which seems to have mutated to be a more highly infective strain, and another from China directly. And as with the 1819 influenza pandemic, transportation and crowded conditions facilitated the, excuse me, the spread of the virus, but air travel was the key difference with our current predicament. There's also another added feature to this that bears emphasizing. That is the important reach of our global food system, itself a topic of long interest to environmental historians. In just the United States alone, according to data collected by the Food and Environment Reporting Network, as of today, August 19th, 2020, at least 748 meatpacking and food processing plants and 100 farms and production facilities have confirmed cases of COVID-19 disease. At least 56,057 56, workers have tested positive for COVID-19 and at least 239 workers have died. Not unsurprisingly, many of these workers come from some of the more marginal portions of American society. People of color, immigrants, and people in relatively low income families are disproportionately employed in meatpacking plants. Almost one half or 44% of meatpacking workers are Hispanic. And one quarter or about 25% are African-American. Across all occupations of people working in animal slaughtering and processing, more than half of all workers are people of color. And if you think that this issue of socioeconomic status and our industrial food system is confined to the United States alone, read reports of outbreaks at meatpacking and food processing facilities in Germany, France, the United Kingdom. And last week, on August 11th, the government of New Zealand, which had gone 102 days without any community-level transmission, announced four cases in one family. And this new cluster now has grown to approximately 75 people testing positive and some 20 households being infected. One likely source, which is still under investigation, is a shipment of frozen food from a port in China. The third theme, epidemiology. We'll delve into a little bit more depth in this theme. It has become a stock phrase or a cliche with the current pandemic that we're all in it together. Nothing could be farther from the truth, now or during the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. The epidemiology of both pandemics underscores a common opinion among historians and epidemiologists alike. The epidemic disease shines a harsh light on pre-existing conditions, socioeconomic, cultural, political, and of course, environmental. It is estimated that about 500 million, 500 million people, or about one third of the world's population at the time, became infected with the H1N1 influenza virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with about 675,000 in the United States alone. What was different about this pandemic was the mortality was high in people younger than five years old, 20 to 40 years old, and 65 years and older. The high mortality in healthy people, including those in the 20 to 40 year old group, was a unique feature of this event. A century ago, as with today, public health experts tried to get citizens to flatten the curve. But the 1819 influenza virus didn't affect all Americans equally and not all Americans were equally willing to listen to the advice of physicians, sanitarians, and others to combat the scourge. Although the influenza pandemic came on the heels of the advent of germ theory, many Americans were skeptical of physicians and of distrusting something they couldn't see or feel as causing so much sickness. This editorial cartoon from the North Carolina State Board of Health draws a grim parallel between how many North Carolinians lost their lives in the Western Front during the First World War versus 
how many lost their lives to the flu? Approximately 1,000 versus about 13,000 deaths. 1,000 by machine gun fire and poison gas, 13,000 by the virus. Now then, as now, masks became a subject of keen political debate. But then, as now, many Americans embraced them as seen in these images, while others were known as mask slackers. The ideology or causes of influenza were already broadly understood, so masking, hygiene, ventilation, and social isolation were broadly encouraged to reflect or broadly encouraged to reduce the rates of infection and death to flatten the curve. The final image from Illustrated Current News of New Haven, Connecticut, reflects some of the contested and shifting knowledge around the country at the time. Respiration, contact with contaminated surfaces, avoided poorly ventilated places, these ideas and concepts were in concert with germ theory. But other recommendations, such as avoiding worry, fear, and fatigue, reflect an older notion of humoral health, where bodily fluids or humors, as held by Greco-Roman physicians, were in balance with one another and the external environment or nature of the individual. And then, as now, many others turned to nostrums and bromides, treatments or cures of dubious efficacy, often relying upon appeals to nature as a source of health, purity, protection, and prevention. Previously invented drugs were repurposed as weapons against influenza, just as today, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, an arthritis medicine also used to treat and prevent malaria, has been touted without evidence as effective against COVID-19 disease. The ad for the patent medicine Laxacrin, seen on one half of the screen, falls into this category, a laxative that somehow could provide protection against the Spanish flu. Others touted existing products, notably food or beverages, as curatives, as in the ad for Pluto water harkening back to a Hippocratic idea of health as grounded in a balance between airs, waters, places, and the humors of the body. This ad is resonant with ideas today of using ultraviolet light or bleach, or perhaps the claims most recently publicized on CNN of Mike Lindell, CEO of the company MyPillow, touting the benefits of oleandrin, a toxic extract of the poisonous oleander plant as a novel COVID-19 cure-all. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, Lindell is also on the board of Phoenix Biotechnology, the company selling oleandrin. And then as now, the influenza pandemic did affect all Americans equally. Americans were not in it together then, just as they're not in it together now. Many populations were highly vulnerable to the pandemic because of historical or structural inequalities further heightened by environmental changes. Indigenous peoples notably across North America suffered horribly during the influenza pandemic. As historian Jeffrey also argued in a recent essay for the Atlantic Monthly, disease has never just been disease for indigenous peoples. A historical experience that goes back to the early years of contact and conflict with European invaders dating back to the 15th century. During the era of United States rule, forced removal from ancestral lands and waters that provided food and well-being rendered dependent upon government rations, suffering from inadequate, inadequate and underfunded health care, and seen as primitive and unable to adapt to modern life, indigenous peoples were already vulnerable to the influenza long before the pandemic hit. And when it hit, its timing was lethal for the historical reasons as much as the epidemiological ones. In the Four Corners area of Utah, Colorado, New Arizona, New Mexico, almost 3,300 individuals, many from the Navajo homelands or Dine Vika, perished. In Alaska, entire villages of Inuit and Alaskan natives succumbed with few or no survivors whatsoever. Now, when the 1918 influenza pandemic began, African-American communities were already beset by many public health, medical, and social problems, including racist theories of black biological inferiority, barriers to medicine and public health, and poor health status. Now, the evidence as to how deeply affected African-American communities were at the time by influenza remains uncertain. Some evidence suggests that they suffered comparatively lower mortality and infection rates than white Americans. But 
The problem with relying upon this evidence is for the very reasons that the racist, stru racist structure at the time prevented African Americans from getting good health care, also made data collection among African com American communities difficult. Many African Americans had to rely upon their own resources, their own institutions, their own medical experience, their own hospitals, their own doctors and nurses and public health experts for support. And often they did so with comparatively less funding and less political clout. Nevertheless, ideas about lower rates of influence in African Americans did not derail racist theories about the biological inferiority of black people or overturn conceptualizations of African Americans as disease threats to whites. Finally, against the backdrop of the pandemic were a series of nationwide race wars, to put it bluntly, that emerged during the years of World War I and lasted through the early 1920s. 1919 alone was known as Red Summer because of widespread racial violence from rural Arkansas to the streets of Washington, D.C. One of the more infamous events was the so-called 1919 Chicago race riot, sparked when several young African-American boys were caught swimming near a beach seen as reserved for white Chicagoans on the shores of Lake Michigan. After eight days of violence, 23 black and 15 white Chicagoans were killed. 537 were injured, two thirds of whom were black and between one to 2,000 residents lost their homes, again, mostly African-American Chicagoans. Some historians have argued that the confluence of pandemic influenza and racial strife helped to both conceal and erase the tumult of both events in the memory of many Americans, particularly white Americans. So in many ways, the current pandemic mirrors the earlier pandemic, but is different in several key ways. First, the 1918-19 influenza pandemic, with the exception of some possible vulnerable populations such as indigenous communities, seemed to strike hardest to people early and in middle age. In contrast, COVID-19 seems to hit hardest among the elderly and those with underlying pre-existing comorbidities, a point to which I'll return to in a moment. Second, while I didn't talk or didn't have time today to get into it with this talk, the 1819 pandemic was notable, notably brutal and uh, on countries in what we would today call the Global South. The same is true today with a notable exception. As of this afternoon, the United States still has the highest number of both confirmed cases and total deaths in the world. This reflects some of the underlying political and economic and environmental conditions facing the United States in the early 21st century. And this also leads me to my third point. As with the 1819 pandemic, our current pandemic has overlapped with another period of racial strife and conflict linked to long-standing environmental and socioeconomic changes rooted in de jure or by law and de facto by customer practice segregation, federal policies, policing practices, and a host of other factors. One key difference I mentioned earlier are pre-existing comorbidities, which often track with socioeconomic status and racial identification. As I'm exploring my current research on diabetes and chronic disease, these comorbidities grew out of longstanding environmental changes, from changes in our diet to patterns of persistent and ingrained segregation to unequal exposures to diabetogenic or diabetes-causing chemicals or obesogenic or obesity-causing chemicals. These together combined with economic and political changes have unfolded unequally across the United States over the past century. Communities of color on average have higher incidence, meaning number of cases and prevalence, the distribution in a population of many cancers, diabetes, specifically type two, obesity, cardiovascular disease, tuberculosis, and a host of other health conditions. Infant mortality rates and low birth weights are far more commonplace in African-American, Native American, and Hispanic Latinx communities than in the general population. Making these pre-existing conditions worse is the problem of access to health care, affordability of health care, and lack of insurance. In 2017, 10.6% of African Americans, 16.1% of Hispanics and Latinx Americans, 14.9% of Native Americans and Alaskan Natives, 8.3% of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, and 7.3% of Asian Americans were uninsured compared with 5.9% of non-Hispanic Latinx whites. These health disparities have shown up in the COVID-19 statistics for positive testing, for hospitalization, and for death rates. Black and Latinx people have been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus, as have Native peoples, in a widespread manner that spans the country throughout hundreds of counties in 
urban, suburban, and rural areas, and across all age groups. This slide taken from the COVID-19 racial data tracker this afternoon shows the disparities. Black Americans have been hit the hardest, but other communities such as Native Americans and Alaska Natives have been hit hard too. For example, as of Tuesday night, last night, on the Navajo Nation, the country's largest sovereign Native reservation, the total number of cases reached 9,486. The death toll is now at a 480 individuals with 6,987 recoveries and a total population of only approximately 174,000 as of 2017. But even these numbers may be suspect because of long-standing problems with data collection and chronic underfunding of the Indian Health Service, the federal agency charged with Native and Indigenous health in the United States. Race and hospitalization rates track with painful fidelity to places known to have wide disparities in socioeconomic status and to be populated by communities of color. In Maine, African Americans a population that includes many recent immigrants from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan, as well as North Africa, comprise just 1.4 of our state's total population, but account for 22% of the COVID-19 cases as of the end of last month, July 2020. Even these numbers don't paint the whole nature of the story of the disparities in the epidemiology of COVID-19. And now, to the final part of my talk, the aftermaths. Historians are not prognosticators, but if we do have one superpower, it is historical thinking, which requires us to consider what I often tell my students are the five Cs, change over time, causality, complexity, context, and contingency. To this list, environmental historians have to add the added complications of our entanglements with an ever-changing and uncertain natural world, from the level of planetary climactic systems in a state of change thanks to human intervention into the workings of our planet to microbes such as viruses that can strike us down unexpectedly and with seeming surprise. So we have to wield the superpower with humility because just as our interpretations of the past change in light of our current circumstances, our present and future are very much in motion. Nevertheless, based on an environmental historical understanding of past pandemics, and how our present pandemic has currently unfolded, there are a few possible aftermaths in our new, near future. In the interest of time, I don't delve too deeply into the lasting consequences of the 1819 pandemic, but one of the most striking to me as a historian is the collective amnesia, which Albert Camus so pithily identified in the quotation which I led this uh, presentation from his classic book, The Plague. Against the backdrop of the post-World War I recession, ongoing racial conflict, concerns over the rising tide of global communism, the subsequent wedge scare in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Rev Revolution, and the rise of the so-called jazz age in the roaring 20s, many Americans quickly forgot about the pandemic that killed at least 675,000 citizens. But as I'll note in my conclusion, not all Americans have forgotten, which may provide us with some hope as to what history can contribute to understanding our current plight. One possible aftermath is how the current pandemic may exacerbate pre-existing conditions, such as socioeconomic inequality. One summary measure of this is the Gini index. The Gini coefficient or Gini index compares the income or wealth distribution of a population to a perfectly equal distribution in which every citizen of a city or country or a given region has equal wealth. The Gini coefficient ranges from zero, indicating perfect equality, where everyone receives an equal share, to one, perfect inequality, where only one recipient or group of recipients receives all of the income or wealth. This 2017 map from the US Bureau, of Census, US Bureau of the Census captures some of the socioeconomic gaps in the nation. And they're not all concentrated in cities such as New York or San Francisco. Indeed, large belts of inequality in rural regions such as the Ohio River Valley, the Rio Grande River Valley, Appalachia, and pockets in the upper Midwest point to the phenomenon identified among white populations by economists Angus Deaton and Holly Case, who have noted the rising levels of mortality and morbidity among lower income native born white Americans. The opioid epidemic, deindustrialization, higher rates of suicide and alcoholism and resulting in chronic liver disease. These have led to what Deaton and Case have called deaths of despair. Some of these deaths of despair are perhaps what motivated many Americans to vote for a change in leadership in November 2016, 
And it's arguable that the pandemic has both inflamed and exacerbated these divisions to what end remains perhaps uncertain. Likewise, it's important to remember that another possible economic outcome of, or environmental outcome of the virus is going to be one around questions of changes to the physical environment. Many of commentators have noticed that the precipitous decline in air and auto travel has yielded benefits with decreased air pollution, decreased carbon emissions, and the seeming revival of wildlife. But these benefits may be short-lived and quickly erased as nations return to pre-pandemic levels of consumption and economic activity. Related to this point is the surge in biomedical waste, which itself is a complicated story. The demand for personal protective equipment, or PPE, plus the use of equipment for life-saving treatments and interventions, from intubation tubes to intravenous drug bags, creates a lot of garbage. According to the South China Morning Post of Hong Kong, hospitals in Wuhan, home to 11 million people and 80% of those who died from COVID-19, produce more than 240 metric tons of medical waste daily during the peak of the outbreak, compared with some 40 tons before the epidemic. The central government deployed 46 mobile medical waste treatment facilities to the city and built a new plant with a capacity of 30 tons within 15 days of arrival. The measures were designed to, to increase the city's waste treatment capacity from 50 tons a day to over 260 tons. Now in the US, the statistics, the statistics are more complicated and contradictory. Many municipal waste management facilities, garbage and recycling companies, and individual hospital systems did not see a huge spike in waste because of reuse of limited personal protective equipment and a large decline in elective procedures. But the seeming lack of a biomedical waste surge, at least in the United States, does not hide the longstanding problem with the global biomedical waste trade. According to a recent letter in the Lancet Global Health Journal by physicians and public health experts in Bangladesh, an estimated 5.2 million people, including 4 million children, die from unmanaged medical waste across the planet every year. According to the authors, in April 2020 alone, at least 14,500 metric tons of waste was generated across Bangladesh, nearly double the average monthly rate pre-pandemic. Incineration, improper disposal and handling, exposure to chemicals can all cause acute and chronic health conditions, including many of the core comorbidities such as diabetes or types of cancer that can peak people at risk from COVID-19 disease. And many of these exposures come about from the improper disposal or management of biomedical waste, among other types of refuse. A third possible aftermath is how the pandemic might reinforce or reshape ideas about seemingly innate biological differences between individuals and population along lines of race, supposed susceptibility to disease, and notions of naturalness and purity. Many of the arguments put forward for the first Immigration Act in U.S. history, the infamous 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, rested upon ideas that Chinese migrants were harbingers of disease, as well as threats to national racial purity and white male labor superiority. At various moments in U.S. history, fears over immigration have led many to call for the exclusion of immigrants or the expulsion of undesirable residents, as seen in this 1909 cartoon of Uncle Sam on the right, playing the Pied Piper to lead Italian rats out to sea. It remains to be seen in the aftermath of COVID-19 disease at this moment of seeming racial reckoning might lead to a reassessment of long-standing linkages between race, nature, and health. But it's important to understand and note that the repeated references to the, quote, Wuhan virus, end quote, or, quote, China virus, end quote, or persistent conspiracy theories that the SARS-CoV-2 virus was intentionally released by the People's Republic, Republic of China have a longstanding and sordid history we would, be do, we would do well to remember. A fourth possible aftermath are the continued debates over the efficacy of our institutions to deliver quality, scientific, and medical expertise in an era of increasing skepticism, if not outright hostility, towards science and medicine. And much of this hostility is rooted in long-standing notions of nature as a source of purity and the measure of proper behavior and well-being. Take the example of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention which was founded in 1946 in Atlanta, Georgia, out of lessons learned during the efforts to eradicate malaria in the United States, in the American South in particular, during the Second World War. Malaria had become endemic to the region by the late 18th century and was a leading cause of death for much of the 19th century. But a concerted effort, first led by the U.S. Public Health Service, then by the CDC, 
created in 1946, helped to eliminate malaria in the continental United States by the early 1950s. The CDC became the epitome of public-oriented science and medicine, helping to lead efforts to boost immunization and vaccine, eradicate polio in the US and smallpox worldwide, and prevent the spread of novel emergency diseases such as, such as HIV AIDS beginning in the 1980s. But by the time the CDC deployed its resources against the current coronavirus pandemic, its mission was compromised. The CDC's budget fell 10% from 2010 to 2019, according to health policy organization Trust for America's Health. This mirrored the shift in American healthcare more generally away from public health and preventative measures and more towards ever more expensive clinical interventions and pharmaceutical solutions. The politicization of the CDC and other government agencies, a trend that reached warp speed following the inauguration of Donald Trump in January 2017, further undermined efforts. Confused, confused messages from the CDC about how citizens should protect themselves, for example, delays in issuing mass recommendations justified as a response to PPE shortages, have only added to the mix. Coupled with outdated and outmoded data collection storage technology, understaffing, and low morale, it is all but likely that organizations since the CDC facing this new political climate, not to mention the World Health Organization, will need to be rebuilt or renovated if they are to be effective against future public health emergencies. Linked to the limitations of our institutions are longstanding fears over vaccination that have given the SARS, COVID-2, and other coronaviruses um, now a part of our changed environment. We will need a vaccine because this coronavirus and other coronaviruses to come are not going to go away. We need to adapt to this new material reality, this new environment, if you will. As with seasonal influenza, we will need to rely on a herd immunity and good hygiene even after we develop effective treatments, which will include effective vaccine. But as many of us know, skepticism or outright hostility toward vaccines often rooted in ideas of natural purity and concepts of well-being are longstanding. They stretch back to the early efforts at inoculation, inoculation by Edward Jenner, and they continue with added force throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. And in recent years, anti-vaccination activism has surged and it particularly follows along a variety of lines that don't always respect partisan boundaries, income, or socioeconomic status. Many of the protests against the COVID-19 lockdowns in the United States, Canada, and other countries have emerged from or been amplified by the anti-vaccine movement. Public health authorities are rightly worried that even if we have an effective vaccine, many will refuse to be vaccinated, thus making the goal of acquired herd immunity that much harder to achieve. I don't want to end on a completely depressing note. And I do, however, want to emphasize that if there is any hope in this moment of dire consequences is, is that history provides us with a set of tools to make sense of the past, understand the present, and think about possible alternative futures. One key insight of environmental history is that matter matters. The natural world in which we are unfolded and part of very often sets the terms under which we can act with a degree of agency and a degree of independence. But we also create and co-create the environments we live in. This virus spreads very effectively thanks to modern transportation, building technologies, ventilation systems, and the ways in which we conduct commerce, business, education, recreation, and so many other activities. The virus has its own evolutionary history, but we can choose what type of political decisions what type of ethical calculations and what type of ideas we have for community to engage the world as it is and shape a possible better world to come. The stakes they're facing us are great, but they were equally great for those that came before us a century ago during the 1819 influenza pandemic. My hope as a historian is that the future has yet to be written. The present is the contested terrain on which we must stand but the past can provide us with tools and understandings that might make that journey a little less perilous. Thank you for your time. I'm now going to end the slideshow and we'll start having some time for questions and answers.
All right. We've got some questions coming in here. All right. Um, let's see. How has federalism limited government limited the response to COVID-19 in the United States? And by the way, um, uh, hi, Alex. Um, good to see you. That is a that is a great question, and it's one I think was embedded in some of my comments. But it is a particular challenge. So again, what Alex is referring to is the idea of federalism and limited government. And of course, there's been a lot of shifts in this in the past, you know, 30 or 40 years, particularly with the Reagan revolution and then the tack towards centrism under the Democratic Party with uh, the presidency of Bill Clinton, is that the devolution of powers from the federal government to the states means that states very often can operate in a certain degree of latitude that the federal government cannot dictate the way you can say in a country like the People's Republic of China. So on the one hand, federalism uh, coupled with a, an innervated um, series of institutions responsible for directing uh, you know, public health science and um, resources have very much um, it very much is responsible for the fractured uh, system we have. This is why Greg Abbott in Texas can charge ahead with reopening until the virus snaps him back to the material reality that the virus doesn't care whether the state is red or blue, or the governor is Democratic or Republican. And likewise, Maine can have a comparatively um, better response as a result of its own state decisions. But the one thing I might add, and I don't want to get too far into this because this is a little bit out of my area of expertise, and I would defer to my colleague and friend, Andy Rudolevich or uh, Jeff Salinger in the government department, is that other countries have federal systems. One of the most notable probably is Germany. And in the case of Germany, uh, you had an initial surge of cases primarily in the state of Bavaria, which borders Italy, and very likely many of the cases that entered Germany were um, German uh, citizens going over on vacations to Italy and then bringing it back to Germany. And what happened very early on is that the state of Bavaria had a very forceful and strong response, and then the federal government got involved. But one of the things that happened is that the states in Germany had a degree of trust in the institutions with science, with public health, and the leadership of Germany with Angela Merkel, who of course is trained as a scientist and listened to the scientists, they were able to put into effective practice contract, contact tracing, widespread testing, closures. And so to a relative decree, degree, Germany was able to emerge among Western European nations relatively unscathed, say compared to Italy. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And um, yeah, the problem is with 50 states and assorted territories, which are more under direct federal control, we're going to have a fractured response. It was kind of baked into the system, if you will. Okay, I have a question here from uh, Beto. Hello, Beto. So uh, health standards in schools seem to be uh, showed uh, disparate experience of 18, 19, and 20 in USA. As a CNN article discusses, uh, metros in New York, Chicago, New Haven kept schools open, a decision born out of progressive era ideologies with an emphasis on hygiene in schools and more nurses uh, for each student than is thinkable now. How much do you think the progressive era thinking affected decisions to keep schools open and what lessons can school administrators, state and federal officials learn now from the 18, 19 pandemic? So that's a great question. And one key difference is that it's important to keep in mind that in the case of some of the schools during the 1819 pandemic, there, one of the other things that came out of the progressive era, which may or may not be a source of comfort for those on the call, was the rise of physical education and nature study, getting kids outdoors because the idea that staying indoors was going to lead to enervated bodies and by extension an enervated and weakened nation. So you already had a lot of experience at the time with teaching classes outside in the fresh air. And this is what many school districts did. Of course, it depended if you were in California versus Maine as to how long during the season you could do that. Another key thing is that one difference between the progressive era and now is that it's not as though there weren't mask slackers. It's not as if though there weren't people that didn't want to believe in the pandemic and the ravages that the influenza virus could wreak. It's not as if though there weren't people that didn't think that they shouldn't be told what to do. But one thing is that in the era you're mentioning, which is the tail end of the progressive era, you already had large degrees of investment in public health to combat the scourge of infectious disease, to build up infrastructure through municipal wastewater treatment and water systems, electrical lighting, um, a whole host of activities, as well as a larger mindset, which made many political leaders more amenable to public health interventions. Now, it's not to say that everyone bought it. The 
story that's told time and again is the contrast between the city of St. Louis and um, the uh, city of Philadelphia, where the political leadership in Philadelphia wanted to go ahead with a bond rally to raise support for U.S. forces in Europe. And of course, afterwards, cases just exploded in Philadelphia, whereas in St. Louis, the commissioner of public health was able to persuade the mayor to hold off on large gatherings, and St. Louis was able to flatten the curve. But I'd say that's one key difference there. So what I'd say what we could learn today, uh, put your faith in science, put your faith in public health experts, but also by the time you address a public health crisis, if you don't already have the parts in place to address it, it's almost too late. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing in the case of our own country, uh, as well as other countries that have suffered disproportionately from the pandemic, is that the underfunding of public health structures is not gonna be discovered until it's too late. It's basically like ignoring maintenance on your home until you find out one day that your foundation is rotted and your wooden clapboards are riddled with termites. So, okay. Uh, question here, can I expand how a pandemic connects with my forthcoming book? Thanks, Scott. Um, quick question I'd say is it's basically it's going to be the epilogue. And what it does is COVID-19, you know, like all pandemics, exposes longstanding socioeconomic and environmental inequalities. And one of the things that um, we learned very early on, and we're learning with greater and greater precision and greater and greater uh, grim results, is that comorbidities, um, uh, these are pre-existing conditions, um, uh, are one of the best indicators for how severe the course of the disease may be in an individual and also how it affects certain populations. And given the fact that my own work, which is looking at diabetes, which tracks with painful fidelity along, this, along lines of socioeconomic status, especially over the past 50 years, uh, it's not surprising to me, even as depressing, that unfortunately Black Americans, Native Americans, Latinx Americans, uh, poor whites, uh, are ones that are suffering disproportionately. So that's how it's gonna connect. And essentially the changed landscapes as well as the changed bodies that resulted in the diabetes epidemic have laid the groundwork for the current pandemic that's also affecting us unequally. So thanks. Um, Van, do. It seems that environmental issues may be taking a back seat during this pandemic, such as increase in plastic use, recent oil spills in Russia and Mauritius. How do we ensure that post-pandemic recovery does not result in a resurgence of policies detrimental in the environment? That is a, that is a, um, a great question. I think the, the quick answer I would give is I think it matters who's in office. So at least in the United States, it matters what's going to happen on November 3rd. Um, I also think that one refreshing thing to see out of a lot of the thinking about the pandemic has been that a variety of writers have been warning us that right now we may need a lot of PPE. And right now we may need to think carefully about um, particular policies that might make it harder to fight the pandemic. But they're also saying that the examples of um, decline in certain types of consumption, such as petroleum or flying, point to the fact that maybe we could pivot to a low carbon or carbon free future easier than maybe we thought. Um, one of my favorite writers on this, there's a couple, there's um, uh, Alexis Madrigal and Ed Yong of the Atlantic uh, Magazine Monthly have done a lot of good work on this, that it doesn't need to be an either or choice, but I do think we're gonna have to be vigilant and think about those things. So I think that's a good point. Um, David, uh, building on the question about federalism, how does this differ between the 1919 pandemic and today? There are differences both between federal power and expectations between that era and ours, and be curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the interest of time, one key thing is that um, the wake of particularly post-war liberalism and its rise and fall, and particularly the Reagan revolution and the devolution of federal authority uh, to the states, and the diminution of certain federal agencies, I think is one key difference. Um, another thing is that a difference between now and 1918, 1919 is that we did not have a national agency to the same degree we do such as the CDC, which um, has stumbled to be quite honest, but also uh, even in its stumbling still is better than nothing. Um, 1819, you had the US Public Health Service, but you didn't have any sort of national agency that provided surveillance and control and prevention like you did with the CDC, nor did you have the biomedical research that was funded again in the post-war era, 
um, such as the National Institutes of Health. And you know, this is stuff you know far better than I do, David, being you know, the expert that you are in post-war history of science, technology, and medicine. But I think that would be uh, some, some of the key differences that might come to mind. Another final thing might be that trust in federal institutions, this is always difficult because I don't know if there was polling done back then versus now, there was trust in institutions and trust in government, perhaps maybe in some certain degrees more at the beginning of the century than today. But I would have to defer to my colleagues in political science who do political history as to whether that um, would be a correct analogy to make. So, hi, John Branch. Code of, code of COVID-19 mitigation is often framed as involving an inherent trade-off between health and economic activity. How was that understood in 1819 uh, with the pandemic and has it changed over time? That's a great question. I can't give you perhaps a super detailed answer, but maybe I'll, I'll play the historian card and look at past evidence. The, I want to say it was either the National Bureau of Economic Research or one of the Federal Reserve Banks recently did a study looking at cities that were more aggressive in their lockdowns and more brutal in their public health practices versus ones that were more lax and which cities recovered faster. And not unsurprisingly, cities such as um, Seattle that were stricter or St. Louis that were stricter seemed to recover faster based on a variety of economic indicators such as consumer spending, um, uh, manufacturing output, uh, bank activity, and so on. Um, I think it's a false dilemma. And if anything, I think what the authors of that report, as I remember, were trying to argue is that it's better to endure short-term pain for long-term payoff. But we have to remember that one of the things that's happening now, as opposed to in 1918, 1919, is it's the backdrop against a, a presidential and um, you know, national election where the control of the Senate is very much in play, retaining control of the House, as well as the White House and that we had record economic growth and now it's slowed. And then of course, there's the disjunction between the stock market and the day-to-day -day pain that many Americans are feeling. So um, I think that's as, bad, as good as I can do on that question, but it's a great question. So Peter Blodgett from the Huntington, all right. Um, fellow historian, what historical accounts of the 1819 influenza and of pandemics more generally would you recommend for people seeking to require a well-informed understanding of their role in human affairs? I think that Frank Snowden's recent book published by Yale, Epidemics and Society, is fantastic. It is a slog of a read, but it's a good read. It's just, it's just big. It's like Robert Carroll's The Power Broker. So I would recommend that. He's a historian of medicine at Yale, and it's a fantastic book. Um, I love John Barry as a writer. The Great Influenza is a wonderful book. Um, but I'd also said that Nancy K. Bristow's book on the influenza pandemic is a great one, particularly if we're looking at questions of gender and socioeconomic status. I think that is um, another good book. Um, uh, I'd say those are the ones that immediately come to mind. I think that Plagues and People um, uh, by McNeil is a classic, if a little bit outdated, um, but that's another good one I might recommend. But I think Frank Snowden's um, epidemics in society might be the one-stop shopping for now. And then if you need um, an after-dinner uh, palate cleanser, John Barry is a fantastic writer, and I think he's, he's great. So this is from Blair Troutman. Um, what impact will U.S. privacy concerns about contact tracing limit our future effectiveness and control? That is a great question. I have no idea. I think that that's a very real issue and concern. One thing I might say, though, What's interesting is that some of the stuff that I've read um, in contemporary uh, journalism coming out of China, um, there's been a number of good articles, The Atlantic, Bloomberg, and others have been talking about kind of doing a post more about China's response, is that even in China, there have been concerns about privacy, not raised by the central government in Beijing, but raised by internet providers and technology companies such as Tencent and Alibaba, that they might drive away potential consumers if they feel their privacy is being too compromised. So I'd say that the privacy concerns aren't necessarily a U.S. thing, but it's a, it's a great question. I just, I can't go much beyond that. Um, Emma, Fantastic, from Georgetown. How does the current pandemic and that of the 1918-1919 pandemic fit into the broader concept of the Anthropocene? So the Anthropocene is a concept that's been put forward by a variety of scholars emanating primarily from planetary system scientists that we've entered an era in which it demarks from the earlier Holocene that we have become 
uh, biogeochemical agents influencing the earth on a global scale. And I think that both of them fit very well into the concept of the Anthropocene, that we uh, as human beings have um, become Promethean, if you will, and able to shape the world in certain ways. But unlike Prometheus, this is where the analogy breaks down. He, of course, gets captured by the gods and chained to Mount Olympus and endures perpetual agony by having his uh, innards eaten out. Uh, in our case, our Promethean uh, tendencies have created complicated environments uh, with contingencies and complexities that have come back to haunt us in some ways. And so I think it very much fits in with the concept of the Anthropocene. I think it also might give us pause, as one of the earlier questioners asked, as to how this might allow us to reassess questions around global climate change and other issues that are going to require deep institutional commitment um, and understanding respect for scientific uh, knowledge, as well as the limitations of scientific knowledge, and then creating a sense of community and um, discussion. Um, I want to be respectful of the time. So I just want to make sure real quickly that uh, I'll try to take a couple more questions. I got a five minute warning. So I need to heed the folks at, um, uh, who are in charge. Um, so I'm going to just take a couple of the other ones here. There's a lot of um, uh, questions in here. Um, I'm going to take one here from Ethan Barklow. Environmental historians often debate over the degree to which nature, including microorganisms, have agency. How will the COVID-19 pandemic de impact this debate in environmental history? I don't know. I know where I talk about on the concept of agency, which is among a wide variety of scholars and specific to historians. It's the idea of people individually or collectively to make decisions or take action, even in the most constrained of circumstances. Um, I, for one, have some issues about nature having agency, although that could be extended perhaps to many uh, sentient creatures that show emotion and language, which include you know, creatures on this planet beyond humans. I prefer to think it more about the nature of agency. And what I mean by this is this historian Linda Nash has discussed, um, nature often imposes very strict limits or uh, channels our agency in particular ways. And I think that is, this is gonna further fuel those debates by asking to what degree have we created uh, technologies, systems of knowledge, new environments that have uh, yielded ways in which they present opportunities in some cases, in other cases present real hazards and complexities. Um, let's see. Um, one, um, one final question I'll take here. This is from uh, Hannah, uh, Hannah Levy. Um, uh, do you feel that making surface level comparisons, histor historical comparisons to COVID, e.g. Spanish flu is helpful or harmful given today's diverse, div divisive context? If you were a public speaker speaking on this issue, would you try to draw the same comparisons? Um, I would, and I tried to draw caveats in that. I mean, historians are in the complexity business um, and we're not in this business of writing just so stories. At least I would argue uh, good historians, academic historians are not. So I think drawing the comparisons is apt so long as you draw the differences between those comparisons. And there are some very key differences between the 1819 pandemic and the, um, our current situation. So I would say that if I were in a more public forum, I would feel comfortable drawing those comparisons. And indeed a number of historians and writers, you know, on the subject, such as John Barry, author of the wonderful book, uh, The Great Influenza, have done exactly the same as an effort to try to get us to think about history doesn't, you know, there's that old cliche that those that learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That's a cliche and it's not, it's something that rankles a lot of professional historians. But if there's a grain of truth in it is that historical thinking can provide us a way of understanding the past on its own terms and then thinking about how past events might provide new ways of thinking about the present. Masks are a perfect example. One key thing that was very interesting with all of, of this pandemic is that very early on, people in countries such as South Korea, the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, were ones that immediately adopted mask wearing because they had most recent experience with the SARS and the MERS outbreaks. But in the United States, we'd forgotten that mask wearing was once socially acceptable if contested as an effective means of helping to limit community transmission. And now, sadly, because we're not thinking about the past, we're having to fight these battles all over again. Um, Wonderful questions. Thank you so very much. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. I would encourage any of you that if you have further questions, please feel free to send me an email at uh, my email address, which is listed on the presentation and freely available on the Bowdoin website. And I'd be happy to chat with you. Once again, I am 
honored and touched at the uh, intelligence, the compassion, and the resilience of Polar Bear Nation. And I'm not a Bowdoin alum, but I went to another school with a bear mascot. So as a UC Berkeley graduate, now proud Bowdoin scholar, uh, go you bears and thank you so much. Be well, take, safe, uh, take care, be safe, and remember above all else, uh, keep your distance, wear a mask, practice good hygiene, and uh, preach kindness. Thank you.